Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul. This is Christine. Christine is Linda's niece. Marcus uh, asked us to share with you this afternoon. So why don't we uh, pray first and just uh, see God's peace in this time. So Father God, just uh, speak to us now. Comfort us in this time of hurt and loss. And uh, help us to be joyous in uh, remembering Linda and celebrating her life. And uh, just give give us the words to speak now that we might uh, all leave here with your comfort and your peace that passes all understanding. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Aunt Linda, as I knew her, we're gathered here to celebrate the very full and well-lived and yet short life of Linda Castillo. Although I, apparently there's some variations on the pronunciation of that last name that have come to light in recent months. But actually, um, all right, getting off script already. But the um, first time I met Linda, Marcus, and Brendan was when I married this young lady um, 2.8 years ago. And uh, they've involved us in their family ever since. And I'm extremely grateful for that. And uh, <clears throat> when we were at West Point, which was a, a thrill to see Justin graduate, who I'd never met until <laughs> we're hunting him down on the field, she's yelling Castillo. And I'm like, it says Castillo when, when you read it. So. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Marcus asked us to share somewhat of an eternal perspective on this day. So hopefully we can share some words of comfort. These earthly vessels we sit in here today are just that, vessels. The soul within us is what makes us who we are. This vessel sitting next to me is just that. Linda is not here. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of friends and family here today. There's a popular saying that uh, family are the people you're born with. And we've been fortunate in that, and friends are the family that you choose. So, I guess we're all family in that case. This certainly is a sad time, and we weren't planning this day. As we, we came here from the other coast of Florida, I was planning on being back there wearing that video camera, but Marcus asked, asked us to come up here, so pardon my casual attire, but I think Linda would have been okay with that somehow. Um, we were planning on actually celebrating Grandpa's 90th birthday, which I just did, and we were out of the country, and we were going to do a second celebration, but anyway, there's grief now. And sometimes that grief flows over us in waves, knowing, knowing this from losing both my parents. It just it wafts over you, and it's good to let it through and let it out. And it's a healing thing. Um, as they say in Australia, where I spent my formative years, everything's better after a good sit down and a cry. And it certainly is. But soon that grief is replaced for many of us with the hope and joy that the separation is only temporary. Because you see, Linda had a relationship with our Creator. Jesus was her Savior. And He has welcomed her into His embrace for all eternity. That soul of hers is with Him. But why now? Why so young? And He was asking why bad things happen to good people. And in Linda's case, I don't think we'll ever know. Perhaps her body was tired from living life at full throttle, which I think she certainly did. And, um, overall, this world is spinning out of control, and we all make bad choices, and sometimes those choices negatively impact others. And pride and sin separates us from God, living a life apart from God. However, Linda believed and wrestled with God. And certainly 
they believed in him. Perhaps that's why Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago, so that you wouldn't have to debate on the Castillo. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So she wrestled with God. It wasn't that she doubted. She just wanted to know. The Bible says if you seek him with your whole heart, you will find him. And she certainly did find him. So one more thing I'd like to share with you. Christine and I were blessed to have recently returned from the Holy Land, which was an amazing experience. And if you ever, well, don't if you ever, just make the, make the choice and go, because it's... Uh, any of you that have read the Bible, it brings it to life in 3D. Psalm 23 is often shared at times like this. And uh, our guide on that trip shared it from a shepherd's perspective, from David's perspective, who was a shepherd. And I'll just throw in some of the things that he said as I read through it. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And as we drove down towards the Dead Sea, we looked up to the right to these barren hillsides. And he said that when it rains, these hillsides come alive with green grass. And so those are the green pastures that David was referring to. And it's so important for a shepherd to be able to feed his flock. And so those are little miracles that happen when the, when the rains come. And he leads me beside quiet waters quiet waters. So the Australian accent coming out every once in a while. But when it rains in the desert, there's flash floods down the valleys, but they pool in the bottoms of the valleys. And that's where the shepherd can, can water his flock. Um, he can't water them in the flash floods and they're swept away. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me. Back then there was a road from Jerusalem to Jericho and it was extremely dangerous with robbers and lions and bears, no tigers. And uh, it was deep, so that was the comfort. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod is a device for correcting, it guides us through the road of life. Sometimes God corrects us and disciplines us when we uh, leave the path. The staff is there to lean on, to rest on. So these are things from the shepherd's viewpoint. You prepare a table before my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. The good shepherd protects his flock. He puts oil on the foreheads and the noses of his flock to stop flies from landing and laying eggs and causing fatal illnesses. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Life is short. Life can be a lot shorter than we expected it to be. So cherish your loved ones. Make the most of your time here on earth. And I would personally encourage you to seek the Lord. And if you do with your whole heart, you will find him. Well, to kind of follow up on that, um, life is precious. And it's sweet. And it's way too short. But, um, it's a blessing. We don't promise tomorrow. And um, I'm grateful to be able to be here. We thought we were going to spend time this weekend, but Mark is a little more than a purpose. But um, it's a blessing to be able to be here. The Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 8 says, There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, 
a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. You know, there are a lot of opinions about God and about death and about heaven, and we all come from different backgrounds, and we've all heard things and kind of formed our own opinion. But I want to share with you using our standard, and that's the Bible. And the reason we're doing that is because Mark has confirmed what we already knew to be true, that we would have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to share with you from our perspective and her perspective. You know, it's pretty reasonable to say that Linda touched your life in some way because you're here today. And as a matter of fact, if you've ever had a conversation with Linda, you never had to wonder where she stood. <laughs> um, she was going to tell you, and uh, a lot of times with determination, but mostly with love. And uh, even when you didn't want to hear it, she told you what you needed to hear. You didn't hear it. And that's someone that really loves you. Um, she was pretty immovable once she made up her mind about something. She was dead set to go do that. So my Aunt Linda definitely touched my life. Um, she was about 15 years older than me, so she was a <coughs> cool aunt. You know, she drove a cool car, and she made out cool clothes, and you know, she was like the hip aunt. But besides those things, you know, she, she really instilled some jewels to me as a child. And I don't remember the exact time, but I remember being in the car with her and she just saying to me, Christine, just never, never let jealousy get the better of you. Always beware of jealousy. And I thought, well, what in the world is she saying that to me for? Because I was, I don't know, maybe 11 or 12. I had not experienced anything where I was going to do with jealousy. But that was a seed in my heart that helped me decide to be a better person and to not let jealousy dictate my attitude, my actions, and I treasured that. I treasured that. So in a lot of ways, as you might hear of, I would come spend summers, um, my dad and Linda were brother and sister, so a lot of times I come spend the summer with my cool Aunt Linda. And she dated Marcus for a long time, and we got to do a lot of things together when I was in high school. Um, you know, I remember uh, her telling me the first time she met Marcus, she, well, she'd known him for a little bit at, at uh, law school, and finally she just got fed up because he didn't ask her out. And so she, she said, you know, are you going to ask me out or what? And he was walking and fell off the side of the curb. Whether <laughs> it really happened that way or not, I don't know. But anyway, so after that, he was smitten, and I think he was probably smitten before. I think he probably noticed her, but... Anyway, so she, she adored Marcus, and um, they dated for a long time through law school, and, and uh, so we had a, I uh, hope you'll just humor me in some of these stories. Um, I came one summer, and I think, anybody remember Hurricane Elena? Which I think was like 1982, if I got that right? 85? Okay. Well, I was visiting. Now, I don't know if you remember the little, Datsun, not even Nissan, Datsun 280ZX, copper color that she used to drive. So I was staying with her and she had a second floor apartment on the water. And uh, we knew there was a hurricane, but we thought we were going to ride it out. So in the middle of the night, they come through with bullhorns and they're like, get out, get out. And so she's screaming, she's trying to get the dog, if you remember her dog December. So she's got the dog and she's got me. And Marcus was going to meet us at Auntie's. I had a 90 some year old great aunt. Auntie M, smart as a whip, forever, and uh, she was in downtown St. Pete, and he was going to meet us there. Well, something happened. He didn't have a lot of gas in the car, and every gas station was closed. He had no gas, so his car didn't have gas. So she loves that. Marcus, you have gas in the car. So we end up, four people now, I think um, if it was 85, I was 17. So Aunt Linda, claustrophobic. She wasn't going to do anything but drive the car. <laughs> and my 90 some year old great aunt was going to obviously need to sit in the passenger side because there was no back seat in a 280ZX. It was a hatchback. <laughs> so we got the dog and we got Marcus, who's like this tall when he pairs into me. So he's like straddling in between the two seats with his head on the dashboard. <laughs> and he's laying on the back. 
and then I'm like squished trying to give it room, and the dog's barking the whole time. And we're stopped on the bridge for two hours, because all the traffic was stopped on the bridge for two hours. That was crazy. Anyway, needless to say, we made it through the storm, but that was just, you know, one of those experiences that we kind of got ourselves into, and it was crazy. I um, had never rode out a hurricane quite that bad. And uh, they took all the tape from the windows and made it into the wall, and I had it for years. It said Hurricane Elena, and we all signed it. And so we, we got into some crazy things like that. But you know, I I have those experiences and those really fun memories. Um, so she loved that little dog, December. I remember when she brought him home, and, and he um, it was December. That's why she named him that. And he was running across the highway, and she stopped and got him, and he was all full of, you know, he was a poodle, so his fur was all filled with all the little briars and stuff, and he was just in bad shape, but I don't know how 20-some years he lived, and he was not a puppy when she got him, maybe three or four, but she loved that dog, oh my gosh, she would cook chicken and rice for that dog. <laughs> when he got older and had no teeth and had to gum that food, I was a big grinder, so anyway, my point being, she loved completely. She didn't just sort of kind of love. If she loved you, she loved everything within her. Even that little dog, Uncle Marcus, just a little friend. So, yeah, in a lot of ways she was my hero. You know, she, she didn't have the easiest life. Her mom passed away when she was only three. And she was living on her own, I think she was 17, when she was living on her own. She found a one-room apartment. She washed dishes in the bathtub because that was where there was an apartment to wash dishes. She worked at a job and she put herself through college. And you know, she wrestled with God. You know, God, you know, God life's hard. Why right? have all these things happen? Um, Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek for me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will leave my aunt with a struggle because I saw her my whole life. God, why do you let these things happen? Why do people hurt? Why do people treat each other badly? And yet her Faith never wavered. She questioned and she asked God. I think that that's okay. God's not afraid of our questions. We have some of questions. That's okay. So she put herself through college and then she put herself through law school. And you know what? As a young girl, she was my hero because life dealt her some really hard things. But you know what? She just decided that it's going to make an excuse. She was just going to rise above it. And not only that, she was going to excel at it. I think it compelled her. And instead of finding reasons not to do something, she put her mind to it, and she did it with excellence. So she's my hero. You know, Linda loved justice. <laughs> there was right, and there was wrong. And yet, you know, sometimes the world doesn't allow us to have the luxury of having all the time just things happen. So she, you know, she would wrestle with God. Why, why, why do divorces happen? And why do death happen? And why, why do And then um, Marcus and Linda had their first son, and they named him Justin, which means justice. She was very proud of that person. She wanted to know, she wanted me to know that your name meant justice. Because even in desiring justice, I believe she had mercy. Because she knew she couldn't fix it all. She wanted people to do the right thing. She was merciful. She wanted to, um, you know, protect you from everything and not have anybody say any bad words to you or correct you or do anything wrong. And, you know, that's just not reality. But for her, she just really wanted to shelter you and think in so many ways. Even though the world still allowed bad things to happen in your life, because that's just, you know, life's hard sometimes. She still sheltered you, and she helped teach you to make wise choices and to become a, a, an awesome young man that she was really proud of. And then, um, you know, she was so excited that you were going to be born. She really was, and uh, she loved you completely. 
And then a couple of years later, Brenda was born, and you know we lived in a different state, and we started getting pictures, and you know there's so much excitement with this other new baby, and you know Marcus and Linda, they, she thrived on being a mom, and they were kind of doing a family thing, and you know the boys went uh, to scouts and Royal Rangers, and they played sports and graduated from high school and went to college, and you know she just loved being a mom, and Brenda. She shared with Paul and I how proud she was of you for following a dream. You know, you went out for a little bit to LA to try to figure out if you wanted to pursue acting, and you know, she supported you in that. And she was so excited about your writing. She shared with us a little bit about how proud she was that, you know, kind of like her, you're, you're like trying to figure out why things happen, and you want proof, and you want. You know, I think in a lot of ways you were a lot of life. She didn't understand you, and now she totally understood you. She was so proud of you and, and would share some of the things that you were doing. So I hope you'll pursue that. I'm going to be proud of you for that. So anyway, when Paul and I married, um, and I'll try and speed this up, but I don't think anybody verbalized their joy for us more than Linda because Paul and I um, quickly met 17 years ago and almost got together but didn't. Neither one of us ever married. We lost track of each other, and we got married two and a half years ago. And I know my Aunt Linda watching my life was like, well, yeah, God, why can't my niece find somebody? You know, what? who do you have for her? And yet she came to our wedding and she saw, because timing's perfect. It's not always our timing. And she was so happy for us. She celebrated with us. So if you have pain, she agreed with you. If you had joy, she celebrated with you. You guys know this. She always part of life. So Paul alluded to the fact, or actually shared the fact that we just came back from Israel. We were going to share our trip. Linda could not wait for us to come back and share about our trip to Israel. And I was so excited to come and talk with her about it. She said, I wish I could go, you know, and she said, I can't wait to get back. And, um, anyway, I think she'd be okay if I share a little bit with you about what our trip was. So, um, again, to talk about the fact she struggled with God, God, why do you allow things to happen? And yet, Paul and I got to go to Israel. We walked on the streets where Jesus walked. We saw history. We saw proof that the things written in the Bible really are true. They happened a long time ago. We can't relate to some of it, but it's true. So basically, when you go to the land of Israel, it confirms God everywhere. And, and um, first of all, we, we got to ride on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus called his first disciples in John 6. We went to Capernaum, which is where Jesus lived for three years. I don't know if, you're, if you've gone to Sunday school and you've heard the story about the lame man and his friends brought him to Jesus, but there were so many people at the house they couldn't get to him. So his friends called, crawled up on the roof and they cut a hole in the roof and they lowered it down. And Jesus said, get up and walk. Take your mat and go home. And I forgive your sins. We went to that place. We saw it. There's archaeological proof that that happened. Um, we also went to the pool of Bethesda. I know Bethesda, Maryland. Um, Jesus healed a lame man there. That's in John 9 in the Bible. It's amazing to me. This man was lame for 38 years. And he would lay by this pool of water because people believed that when the wind stirred the water that there was healing. So he was hoping someone helped him get in the water. But every time he went to go, somebody get there before him. And Jesus walks up one day and he says, get up. And he literally got up and he took his mat and he walked. Jesus healed this, this person and there's not just the Bible, but there are other proofs that this really happened. And can you imagine being lame for 38 years and Jesus says, just get up? How many of us hurt in our pain? Sometimes in this life, we don't get you. Why? God, why not? And then another place we went, the pool of Siloam, where Jesus put mud on a blind man's eyes. He'd been blind since birth, and he saw it. We went to that pool. We put our feet in that water. So, amazingly, we went to a tomb that just recently has been uncovered, that is a probable site of where Jesus was buried. And the reason that they found it is someone owned the land, and they went to dig for a well, and they found a cave. So they were like, oh, we have to contact the government, they've got to come look. 
Well, they started looking at it with a tomb. The exact description in the Gospels of what the tomb looked like, and it wasn't like every other tomb, because it had to belong to a wealthy man. And that's exactly what Scripture tells us. A wealthy man came and took Jesus' body, and we went to that tomb. It's empty. Whether that's the exact tomb that Jesus was in, we don't know. But it was empty. So, I understand from Marcus... The Linda asked the paramedics to take her pain away. You know, the gospel <coughs> has good news of hope, and I, I want to share that with you again because this is what I believe Linda would have wanted me to share with you today. You know, we can't really comprehend where she's at. But the scripture gives us a little bit of insight. Revelation 21 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. There will be no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Scripture also tells us that when we know the Lord, that someone dies before us, that we'll see them again. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-17. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, which leave us fallen asleep before us. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left with, who are left will be caught up together in the clouds. There's a condition of all this. You know, we think sometimes, you know, I can be a good enough person, I can go to heaven. That, that sounds good, and I think sometimes we wish it was true, but Jesus said about himself on the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. And I'm sharing this with you because this is our truth for Paul and I, for Marcus, for Linda. So life is precious and it's sweet. This life on this earth is way too short. None of us expected to be here today. But Linda tried to make the most of every opportunity. She loved completely she forgave greatly. You know, if she believed in something, she was committed to it 110%. So if anybody had a reason to struggle with life and to ask questions, she did. And, you know, she resolved that. And I think now she sees fully what she believed on this earth. She's standing before the throne of God. No more pain, no more crying, no more hurt. And it hurts us because we can't see her right now. But we have hope that we will see her again one day in heaven. So, thank you for letting us share. Marcus is going to come and share, and thank you for indulging me <laughs> to share some stories.